G'day, it's Jamie, and welcome to Where's My Yowie. Today, I'm reading an old newspaper report about Yowies in South Australia in 1861. So we'll get into it. This was published in Sydney's The World's News on June 28, 1913. Titled, Australian Wild Beasts Bunyips, Jimbras and Mungians, a weight discovery by Edwin James Welch. There is much to be truly thankful for in the knowledge that there are no savage beasts of prey in Australia to make the lot of those who dwell in the outlying parts of this great unpeopled continent harder to bear than it is. Alternating seasons of merciless droughts and destructive floods, such as the one now happily over, are in themselves sufficient to drive stock breeders to the verge of despair, without any addition to the myriads of wild dogs which devastate the flocks of the pastoralist in so many parts of this country. As to their origin, opinions have always differed and probably must continue to do so. But on the subject of their destructive, cowardly nature, there is only one. There is nothing about the dingo to give pause to the man with his finger on the trigger, or to raise a doubt in his mind as to the wisdom, as well as the necessity, for dropping baits on his track or eliminating him by any device that offers a prospect of annihilation. The poet Gordon offers one instance of an appeal for the dingo in one of his weary wayfarer ballads in which he addresses his horse who pricks his ears to the wild dog's note in the tea tree as if begging for a gallop but even then it is solely on account of the horse. Let the dingo rest, tis all for the best. In this world, there's room enough for him and you and me and the rest. And the country is awful rough. The first known reference to a dog in Australia is made by that of quaint old chronicler Dampier in 1688, referring to his visit to the northwest coast of New Holland. He says, we saw no sort of animal, nor any track of, of beast, but once, and that seemed to be the tread of a beast as big as a great massive dog. Passing the gap of nearly a century of years, the next account of any importance comes from the ship's company of the Endeavour camped where Cooktown now stands. Whilst the little ship was careened on an inside beach for repairs, necessitated by the striking of a coral reef. There the men, wandering about in the adjacent bush, saw many strange animals, including kangaroos, but none to give them any cause for alarm except in the case of one man who averred he had seen the devil and been in such close contact with him as he crept through the grass that he could have touched him if he had not been too frightened. Subsequent investigation, however, proved that this fearsome beast was nothing worse than a very large bat furnished by Jack's imagination with horns, wings and such other appendages as he deemed proper for the substantiation of his claim. Now, although the opening up of the interior developed rapidly between the years 1790 and 1861, no mention was made by any of the explorers of the discovery of beasts of prey or, in fact, of animals of any kind antagonistic to man. 
But in the latter year, a strange story was brought in by Messrs. Auden and Hulks. Two searches for pastoral land to the west of Lake Torrens. They saw nothing themselves, but heard from the Aborigines that many fierce animals were to be met within the ranges to the northwest of them. This was accepted in the light of a warning against disturbing them to their own particular territory, and no importance was attached to it. But ten years later, the mystery was revived by a report of a party who had been engaged in run hunting still further to the west, and to them the Aborigines had minutely described the killing of three white men and their horses by Jimbras, large and very fierce animals akin to apes or monkeys, which came from the neighbouring ranges, and at once it was suggested the possible fate of Leichhardt was recounted for, especially as cattle bones in large quantities had been previously reported from the same locality. But no white evidence was forthcoming in support of these stories. Aboriginals only being able to describe these dangerous beasts, in common fairness it must be admitted that all their stories agreed remarkably well, both as regard to the size and build of these Denzians of the ranges. But why, if there was no foundation for their existence, they should have always been described as of the monkey or ape species is somewhat of a puzzle. In view of the fact that no animal of that class could have been known to the Aboriginal tribes in any part of this continent. Even the Aborigines on Cooper's Creek waters had a similar legend relating to some fierce animals, which they called Munions, belonging to another fella country, long way where sun sit down, and the children of the tribe were easily frightened by the mere mention of the word Munion, much more so, in fact, than the oft-repeated threat of consignment to the equally mysterious Bunyip, who occupied a large water hole on the lower part of the creek immediately before its waters became lost in a mul multiplicity of shelly, polygonum-lined channels trending to the southward and westward. Both the Jimbra and Munyan and the Bunyip remain to be discovered by some fortunate explorer in the future. For the present, it is sufficient comfort to know that, with the exception of the northern alligator or crocodile, and an occasional tiger of the Tantanula species, the wanderer in the bush may feel secure from molestation by any death-dealing animal or more hurtful capacity than himself, unless by chance he comes in contact with some juvenile Australian sportsman armed with the cheap and deadly P-rifle of commerce, which has been a direct cause of plunging so many worthy families into mourning. The end. Well, that's a really interesting account. A um, couple of points here I'd like to mention. Uh, it's interesting how Dampier when he came to Australia in 1688, they didn't see any beasts or anything, but they saw a footprint as big as a great mastiff dog. So I'm wondering what they actually saw, like what it was that left the footprint. And then I really laughed and thought it was funny that when Cook's uh, ship was, um, the Endeavour was at Cooktown, and the guys got into the bush and he's come out and he said he's seen the devil and it had horns and wings. And it turned out just to be a bat. But if you think about it, like in England, their bats are pretty small compared to our flying foxes. So I can understand why it's scared him, but it's still funny. And then it's interesting how the average described the killing of three white men and their horses by Jimbras. I wonder what happened there. And then these mungings they're talking about. 
I wonder if they're like Jimbras or Yowies or something else altogether, but it seems really interesting that they sound more terrifying than the Jimbras, which they themselves are pretty terrifying compared to Yowies that we normally know of. Anyway, that's it from me. I'll get back to you all next time. Bye.